Thank you for tuning in to uh, Pierce Politics. We have a very special guest here today, uh, Franklin Pierce alumni and uh, current graduate student here at Frank for Franklin Pierce. Um, what did you study in? Getting my master's in education. Okay, yeah. So very, very fortunate to have him on here today. So we got Eric Jackman, uh, 2009 graduate. Uh, how much has the, the political process changed you know, in the sense of covering politics um, from you know, 10 years ago to now? What would you say is... Yeah, what well, you've seen. first of all, Alex, thanks for having me on the show and inviting me on. I'm oh, you're very truly welcome. honored. This is this is huge. <laughs> but um, things have changed significantly since I was an undergrad student here. I started in 2005, so at that point uh, we were between Bush's re-election in 2004 mm -hmm. and the upcoming 08 election. But of course, in New Hampshire, we know that that primary is really never ends. So yeah. really, a big difference I see is how instant um, a sound bite can get out there or something happening on a campaign. You know, Twitter, Facebook was just really getting going when I was a freshman here at Pierce okay. in 05. And you still had, you had to have a college email address so your grandmother couldn't get on. <laughs> but um, really just how fast news and sound bites and everything moves with campaigns now. So it's, it's, it's now to the point where it's instant gratification, including our politics. So you don't um, say that candidates can really win a campaign based on Twitter, you think, um, going forward or... Can they win with Twitter? Well, well, just in social media in general, I think that's the way that voters are going to go. Or the, the, social media, in a lot of ways, has replaced some of the old school methods of getting the word out. You know, and it, in some ways, has leveled the playing field. And of course, you have the viral video sensation. So if a candidate uh, does something stupid, like kicks a baby in Iowa, <laughs> or you know, uh, is caught partying or something, that that video is going to be up. Now, not necessarily be detrimental to the candidate or their campaign, but Really what we've seen now is social media helps instantly get someone's name out. So yeah. you can't win just using Twitter and Facebook and uh, all the other gimmicks they have, but it certainly um, helps to get to your voters who don't otherwise either read the newspaper or um, don't have a landline so you can't call them. So it's, it's, it's a tool. It's definitely a tool, but uh, it, it, plays, it plays an important role in the process. Now, one difference I uh, you definitely know about from your time covering uh, politics and now is we have uh, non-politicians leading the polls really, really heavily. Um, from D uh, Donald Trump, obviously, you know, of course, you got to meet him a few times. Yep. And you know, Carl Fiorina. Yep. Do you think that you know, in your experience, that these candidates are be able to uh, go forward and win the general election or even their party nomination, or is it just you know, the new hype? Yeah. To kick in. Well, I mean, I definitely agree with Donald Trump when he says, look, you know, people are tired of politicians. They don't want to vote for two-bit losers anymore. Where have, you know, politicians gotten us? So that sentiment is, is going on right now, and that's very strong. And when I think about someone as an outsider or somebody who's not in the fold politically or part of the, you know, so-called political class that run the process, I think about Ross Perot going yeah. back to 1992 when he was allowed into the debates with Bill Clinton um, and uh, George H.W. Bush, the incumbent president who lost to Clinton. Yeah. And there you saw um, it's kind of just a force. This guy was a self-funded billionaire, kind of eccentric, yeah. but was saying things and tapping into a state of mind that the two parties kind of don't really go or, or tap into. Right. So we're really seeing that right now with Trump, obviously. And then, of course, there's a segment of the primary voters, especially evangelicals in Iowa, who are very hopped up on Ben Carson right now, mm -hmm. very excited about him. And in my opinion, the guy is like a zombie. He's just, you know, he's just kind of kind of walking around with his so eyes, uh, eyes closed, you know. So you have no good feelings for uh, Ben Carson winning the election? Or? I mean, the guy's not qualified to be president. Oh, no, I agree. Look, look, like if I needed to get my brain, like, worked on, I'd probably call Ben Carson. But if I need a guy to be president, I'd probably call myself the Donald. But yeah. no, all kidding aside, um, Ben Carson's selling books. You know, if, if you're looking at what he's doing, he's launching a book tour in the middle of a campaign. Right. He's upping his... Which Hillary did before the campaign, which definitely... Hillary? Happened. Well, any self-respecting politician has a book come out, usually a year, six months before a campaign, yeah. to keep their profile up, to keep their media hits going, to get interviewed which, by the which, Sunday morning shows. Which Hillary definitely got to do with her book signing. So oh, oh, they, they all do it. They all... Uh, I mean, but, Trump just had a book come out. Right. Um... So yeah, look, Ben. Car okay, so Ben Carson, Carly Fiorina, and Donald Trump are the three outsiders right now, quote unquote outsiders, and they're definitely tapping into, you know, a segment of the population who is very distrustful of career politicians. 
But, uh, you know, the three politicians that are outsiders, only one could win the nomination. Are you going with Trump to, you know, be the one who would win it, or? Well, you know, you're hearing these whispers about getting Romney in the race, as, you know, mm. who was the standard bearer um, in 2012, obviously lost in 2008 um, to John McCain, and then won the nomination in 12. And a lot of party insiders and your standard um, establishment Republicans are very, very worried about Donald Trump. Yeah. And uh, my brother makes the great point, uh, even though Jeb Bush is very low in the polls and doing terrible in the debates, don't count him out because A, he has over $100 million, and B, he's a Bush. Right. So the establishment is scared, uh, scared of Trump. They really are because, in my opinion, he's not really a Republican. You know, he's in his, he's created his own party, the, the Donald Trump party. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a big fan of what he's doing, uh, really messing with the system and keeping, keeping, putting the Republicans on edge. Because, uh, you know, I, I do think that we need to move away from the two-party dictatorship we have in this country and seek alternatives. Now, is Donald Trump that alternative? We'll find out. We'll have to see. We but will. if Donald Trump isn't to win the nomination, do you think that, um, you know, if Donald Trump, as I said before, he would turn on the the Republican Party would go independent. Yeah. If he, if he wasn't running an independent campaign, do you think he has any chance of either, you know, eliminating a lot of um, respect, re, not uh, eliminating a lot of votes from each party or right. winning it himself? So you're talking about um, he doesn't win the Republican nomination yeah. and then reneges on his pledge there that he signed not to run independent or third yeah. party. I honestly believe um, if he doesn't win the Republican nomination, he's going to absolutely run third party. Or independent because I don't think he gives a rat's ass about the Republican Party. Any pledge he signed, look, a pledge can be ripped up. It's just paper. I'll wipe my ass with it. It doesn't matter. Yeah. That's really how I think Trump feels about it. So um, I would love to see Donald Trump mount an independent campaign because he has something that really no one outside of the system has had since Ross Perot was this media coverage. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Donald Trump could go to a seed vault in Antarctica. And there'd be a news camera there. There'd be there'd be a camera Holy crew 10, there. 15, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. There'd be t you know Fox would have a camera crew there. <laughs> so that's powerful, man. And and both parties know that, and the powers that be know that. So I think in a lot of ways, what the leadership of the Republicans are doing is they're trying to keep them close, but they're not really doing a good job with it. And I'm glad about that because he is really able to do this thing on his own terms. Obviously, not having to take any money from special interests. You know, our, our politicians are basically prostitutes, you know, for the corporations. Yeah. And Trump makes the point that he is not. And I love when he was on the stage saying, you know, I gave to you, I gave a lot to you, you know. And he did, and he's given to everybody. He knows the game. Yeah. So you almost feel like Donald Trump is an insider inside the politics, <sighs> but not as a politician. I make this point. Um, our government is bought and paid for by billionaire class, the oligarchs of Correct. our country, the people who own the corporations, the people who make money off war, the people who, you know, make all the money and have all the power and buy and sell politicians. This time, we're actually seeing one of those guys who's always behind the curtain, out in front, on the, behind a podium, actually running for the office himself. So it's an interesting thing, you know, because on the right, you have the Koch brothers, right. billionaire oligarchs who buy and sell politicians. And on the left, you've got someone like George Soros, who funds liberal causes and funds liberal politicians. And then we have a guy like Donald Trump who's given money to everybody from the Clintons to the Bushes to John McCain to Mitt Romney to mm -hmm. you name it in really the last 30, 40 years. So he understands the process of buying influence and he also understands that really our democracy has suffered because of that. See any chance of uh, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump merging together, they're both very <laughs> anti uh, you know, the establishment, very oh, yeah. anti no, uh, um, big interests. Bernie has done an incredible job of really bringing a lot of these issues out into the light that you otherwise wouldn't hear about during a Democratic primary. And I know for a lot of the Democratic Party, this thing was just going to be an anointment with Hillary and that we weren't going to see a real primary right. challenge. But, you know, here comes Big Bad Bernie, you know, the, the socialist <laughs> from Vermont, free Ben and Jerry's for everybody. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I got to tip my hat to Bernie. I think he's uh, equally has done a fantastic job um, highlighting the corruption of our political process and highlighting the fact that, you know, both parties are bought and paid for by the oligarchs and the ruling class and who gets screwed and stuck with the bill, but we do. So he's done a great job with that. Now, how the hell he's going to pay for all this stuff? I mean, that's, that's anyone's right. guess. I don't know if we scale, you know, I like to say if we flake a little dandruff off the Pentagon's budget, you know, maybe we'd have some money for some of these things. Yeah. So I definitely like a lot about what Bernie's doing. I don't see them coming together for a ticket. I mean, no. I, I think just they have too much 
Trump is just such an ice cold, hardcore capitalist, and Bernie Sanders is, you know, the, uh, the Republicans like to say he honeymooned in the Soviet Union, <laughs> and, yeah. you know, basically call the guy a communist, which I think is a load of bull. But, uh, you know, they certainly would make strange bedfellows. But they've done, the two of them have actually done a lot of good for our political process. So you think that it's two opposite ends? Yeah, they're two opposite ends. And, I mean, imagine those guys in a meeting together. I mean, how would, how would that work? You know, but Bernie, first of all, can we talk about your hair? You know, who does your hair? Someone who's blind? <laughs> someone who's retarded? You know, they just, it wouldn't work out. <laughs> want to take a quick commercial break. Uh, we'll be back on after the break with uh, Eric Jackman. Um, a criminal justice major can aspire to do a lot of things after they graduate. Some of them might not go right into the field just because the criminal justice field is you know, a hard one to get into. There's a lot of competition for it, so having a degree after graduating college isn't all you need. We focus on three parts to the criminal justice system. There's police, courts, and corrections. Our advisor for the club is Jean Dawson, and she's been a great help with us. She's helped out planning numerous separate events. She's just been a good figure to have around. The professors, no matter if they're involved with the club or not, they're great because they want to help out. Granted, they're not the, quote, advisor of the Criminal Justice Club. They're still a professor in the CJ program on campus, and they're always willing to help out and lend a helping hand. Over the past couple years that I've been a club member, we've been touring Ringe Police Department and Jaffrey Police Department. Recently, last year, we toured Keene Police Department as well. But we're looking to work with Ringe Fire and Police Department, and we're looking to see if we can work with the on-campus, like Campus Safety, and uh, the on-campus Fire Department to see if maybe we can get a good softball game going and fundraise some money for charity. Criminal justice is the kind of field that you're going to get jobs by making connections. If you join Criminal Justice Club, you're meeting people from all these different departments, all these events, like you go to conferences, you meet people, and these are the people that you can call and that are going to get you a job down the line. It has worked absolute wonders for me. I've actually almost been given two internships simply by making connections. You can network out of the club, you can come here to study and we'll help you out with your homework. The three, uh, there's three of us up here that are juniors, one's a senior, which is Andy, she's graduating this year. She's done almost all of the classes in the CJ program. To the incoming freshmen, without going to the tutor, we're a valuable asset for them. We can help them out. Um, we can answer their questions that they don't feel uncomfortable talking to someone they don't know. So I think it's just great to join a club in your field in your area of study because they're there to help you. They've been through it and they can give you the advice that you want to hear. We're back on uh, Pierce Politics with uh, Eric Jackman. So Jackman, do you have uh, your own podcast? Tell us about yeah. some of the candidates you met on there. Sure, yeah, I have a... Uh podcast called Jackman Radio and uh, we're on Twitter at Jackman Radio and our website is jackmanradio.podbean.com and of course we're on Facebook so like us on Facebook and uh, yeah basically the format of the podcast is my brother and I and my friend Aaron get together you know maybe drink a few pops and talk about the issues of the day current mm -hmm. events and obviously the election and um, another thing we like to do is interviews and um, we, we launched the podcast in February, and since then we've interviewed the one and only Andy Card, who came and sat down for a couple hours. Great interview, awesome talking to our, our fatherly leader, our beloved president, yeah. the fifth, my favorite president, the fifth president, Andy Card. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we had uh, Lincoln Chafee on from your state. Yeah, Governor Rhode Island. Pour one out for Lincoln Chafee, rest in peace. 2016 race. Yeah, it was a what difficult was, race. What was he thinking? <laughs> And yeah. then uh, we asked Ted Cruz a question when he came to Pierce. Um, we had Gary Johnson call in from New Mexico, who was the Libertarian nominee for president in 2012. Okay. And then uh, last week, my brother and I went down to Lexington, Mass., to Dr. Jill Stein's house. And Jill Stein uh, was the 2012 Green Party candidate for president, and she's running again in 2016. Okay. And uh, we did a filmed interview with her at her house, which was awesome. That's going to be coming out soon. Great interview. And uh, then recently I had Jesse Ventura on, who's yeah. one of my political heroes, you know, an outsider, 
you want to talk about outsider, I mean, he shocked the political world in 1998, beating the Democrat and Republican uh, for to become the 38th governor of Minnesota yeah. on a very minimal budget with no backing of a major party. And um, I'm very, uh, very inspired by him and kind of what his sentiment and what he did. So we like to have your mainstream politicians on and your mainstream guests, but we also like to have people on that we're really interested in, yeah. that have interesting sto life stories and biographies and backgrounds that maybe don't get enough coverage as they deserve. And I heard a possible uh, Lindsey Graham Tom Hall at uh, the Lab Milag is coming up, I gotta, so. I gotta tell you, Alex, this thing with Isolate's gonna take boots. <laughs> We're gonna have to put lots of big shiny boots on the ground with muscly men on aircraft carriers. But uh, yeah, Lindsey Graham, I met him uh, a few months ago at a, at a town hall in Hancock, of all places. Yeah. Hancock. And um, I'm trying to get a town hall together with Lindsey Graham at a bar at Jack Labenlager, where yeah. I know a lot of Pierce kids frequent. And uh, I've been known to frequent uh, from time to time. But uh, yeah, basically what I do, I just approach these campaigns and figure out um, who their communications people are and yeah. chat them up, get a relationship going with them, and, and just be honest with them about who I am and what my intentions are. And what kind of uh, experience do you think that uh, Pierce are, like, you know, allowed you to establish um, in order to be able to have a successful podcast and um, future success? Sure. Um, well, Franklin Pierce really helped me hone um, the craft of interviewing people and having a presence on camera and really uh, believing in yourself and believing in the questions that you have for your guest. And obviously here at the Fitzwater Studio, tremendous opportunities with all the connections that the university has. Um, that we had uh, a guy named George Haggerty was president when yeah. I was here, and he uh, he's actually how Andy Card got affiliated with with the university. Uh, Andy was on the board a number of years ago, yeah. and obviously with our access here in the New Hampshire primary, all the candidates coming. I mean, I had been going to candidate events when I was in high school, and um, I recall coming to Franklin Pierce um, in 2000. It was two or three or four, uh, one of those years. Uh, George H. W. Bush was here with um, Sam Donaldson, Koki Roberts, um, to base, and Marlon Fitzwater to basically open this, christen yeah. this place and open it. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of the Bushes, but it was still really cool to see a former president uh, up close and personal yeah. coming here into my hometown. I'm a local, too. So I always kind of had um, a relationship with Franklin Pierce, um, the university, not the man. He's <laughs> long dead. And, um, you know, it's uh, it's just been a great great place for people who want to um, expand their experiences and expand um, their knowledge on, yeah. on any any field of study really. And politics was natural for me, and I knew I had to stay in the area. And I knew Franklin Pierce would always be a player in the game for the New Hampshire primary, whether it's having candidates come here, or going to events, oh, correct. or the Pierce Media Group covering it, or anything like that. And, and Chris Nevius has done a fantastic job with it. So uh, you mentioned, you know, Franklin Pierce having uh, candidates come to campus and, um, you know, great, you know, great success in that area. One candidate that came to campus was uh, Ted Cruz this summer, and you know, a lot of talk right now is that he's you know, a possible player in the game. That's you know a dark horse, guys with a lot of support from uh, you know different groups. Where do you see Ted Cruz, you know, in this election? Yeah, Ted Cruz is uh, he's very popular in Iowa, obviously with gun owners and with. Yeah. Uh, far-right evangelicals, people who were like really hopped up on religion, and for them, social issues are really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, I know Ted Cruz is very, very to the right on abortion. And in Iowa, you have a lot of abortion activists. So he's really pandering and playing, playing to that group. And he's also, he calls, hit, a theme of his campaign is take on the cartel, you know, the D.C. cartel. Yeah. You know, he calls D.C. a cartel, which, you know, I don't think is very far off. But I don't see Ted Cruz getting the nomination, and I certainly don't see him being on the ticket. But I do see him being a leading voice for the the right, a real stringent, hardcore Tea Party. Maybe a Keystone speaker at the um, at, at the, the local KKK meeting. I was gonna say the um, convention, but you know. <laughs> oh no, no, he'll have a prime time slot at the convention. Absolutely. I mean, you can't ignore um, the large swaths of uh, supporters that he has. But um, you know, I do think he'll probably do better than expected in Iowa. New Hampshire is kind of a moderate t state, a moderate yeah. swing state. So, you know, he his brand, his firebrand of conservatism, will not bode so well here in the New Hampshire primary. Yeah. But I do think uh, Ted Cruz, who was born in Canada, by the way, and no one's really talking about that. Right. I mean, you know. show me the birth certificate, Ted. You were born in Canada. 
You know, he could be a terrorist, a Mexican terrorist from Canada. We don't know. He could be, but we don't know. And um, Ted Cruz, will he'll, he'll be a major player. I mean, he's got that Senate seat, and um, I think he'll keep that as long as he wants it. Um, so you say Ted Cruz and I won't be on a ticket? No. What are the two candidates, or three candidates that are going to be on these in, uh, in tickets? The, in the running for the Republicans, you cannot uh, dismiss Marco Rubio. Marco Rubio is a young guy. You know, I kind of compare him. He's like the Obama to this race, to okay. what Obama was in 08. A young guy, someone who has a pretty thin resume as far as executive experience goes, or as far as really any experience goes. And um, Marco Rubio is pretty popular with young conservatives. Um, you know, he got some Tea Party cred, but he's also facing some problems with uh, when he tried to overhaul immigration. I kind of compare know? Marco Rubio to what? Uh, uh, Barack Obama was to Hillary Clinton, you know, the younger yeah. version, right, with almost Jeb. like the mentor of... Yeah, exactly, and, and you saw uh, Jeb tried to throw shade on him at that debate, man, and just yeah. Marco handed his ass to him, which yeah. was great. That was great to see that. But, uh, you know, uh, Mark, don't count, don't count Marco Ruby out. Like I said, don't count Jeb Bush out. You know, he's a Bush, he's got a lot of money, a lot of yeah. connections. Um, certainly uh, Trump, I mean, God, every... Uh, <laughs> Every scandal, every stupid thing that's come out of his mouth, you know, just watch those poll numbers continue to climb and then remain steady. Yeah. So, you know, the establishment's like, oh, he's plateaued, he's going away. Which, would you consider to contribute that success of, you know, soundbite, the success of that Donald Trump has to soundbite, or do you think that people just truly do support what he has to say? Well, I mean, I like to tell, remind people about this in the last election, 60 million people did not vote. Mm -hmm. Now, of that 60 million people of, of, who did not vote, how many of them are reality TV watchers? A lot. Right? So they're seeing a guy like Donald Trump all of a sudden. They're like, they're paying attention. It's a pretty good show, you know, this election season. I love what Dana Carvey says. I can't imagine a world where Donald Trump is not running for president. And the entertainment factor is incredible, which is kind of a sad thing to say about our political process. Yeah. It's turned to entertainment. But um, he's, he's going to continue to be a player. And uh, but yeah, ultimately getting the nomination, I think you're they're going to go with either Rubio or Bush. Democrat side, Bernie Sanders, you know, <sighs> makes his country a uh, more social place, or no? It's uh, they're not going to let Ber the Clintons aren't going to let Bernie near that nomination. I mean, you got Bill right now. A lot of people aren't talking about this. Bill Clinton is whipping the super delegates, which are a very important and understated part of the process during the primary, lining up super delegates in state by state. Yeah. And you know, the Clintons got them in the back of their pockets, so. Um, Hillary's going to be the Democratic nominee. Uh, Bernie, they'll probably let Bernie uh, speak at the convention when everyone's at the bathroom, so that'll be good. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, Bernie, Bernie's voice can't be discounted, and he certainly won't be forgotten for what he's done. Um, but yeah, it's going to be Hillary, and um, I have some sources from Washington who think that he's the, the vice presidential nominee is going to be Tim Kaine. Tim Kaine. From Virginia. Explain a little bit about him. Tim Kaine was uh, governor of Virginia. And I believe head of the DNC for a time, and you know moderate, Repo moderate Democrat party loyalist, uh, Clinton loyalist. Um, so he's someone who I know is high on Hillary's list. The the Clinton, the Hillary Clinton fan club that she seems to see from both sides. Uh, Donald Trump obviously supporting her, being supported by her campaign, and. Oh look, I gave her money <laughs> because one year, two years, whenever I call, she's gonna do what I say. Look, I said, Hillary, I'll give you a million dollars to the Clinton Foundation, but you gotta come to my wedding and serve cake. And she did. She did. She served cake. It was tremendous. She didn't serve the cake, but she did go to the the yeah. wedding. And uh, that goes back to the point about Trump buying and selling and owning politicians. Martin O'Malley, he play in this at all? Or? You know, th there's part of me that likes Martin O'Malley. You know, like yeah. I like um, I like the I'm Irish. I like the Irish background. You know, working class, roll your sleeves up. Didn't come from money. You know, earned everything that he has. I think that's great. He's a quite a success story in Baltimore. He was a city councilman, and then he he ran for mayor in a yeah. predominantly black city where, um, you know, where do you see a white? Uh, Irish guy being mayor in that city. Yeah. And what he did, man, he went to all the he went to the worst and downtrodden and forgotten neighborhoods and told them what he wanted to do, told them what he did on the city council, and he won them over and he won. Now he didn't get everything done he wanted to do, but it seems that he made some pretty big changes in cleaning up neighborhoods and uh, coming up with a system, a statistic system that tracks crime. Um, I think it's called uh, Comstat. Yeah. where every crime is entered into a database and it's tracked and then they're able to, based on those statistics, make policy change or something like that. I don't know how well it worked. But uh, I do know uh, when O'Malley was mayor, um, they locked up, a, a lot of people were locked up. 
And yeah. uh, if you watch the show The Wire, I mean, anything I know about Baltimore, I learned from The Wire. <laughs> I just finished watching. Have you ever watched that show? No. Yeah, you know what you know about it, though, right? No, I'm not too Yeah, familiar. The Wire is a, it was a TV show on HBO that ran for five seasons that dealt with all aspects of society and life in Baltimore. So you mm -hmm. had the cops, you had the politicians, you had the teachers, you had the unions and the dock workers, and then City Hall, and then you had the newspaper, the Baltimore Sun. So over five seasons, this show kind of did a snapshot and an examination of what life was like in inner city Baltimore. And they had a lot of people who were actually not really actors, but real life people from Baltimore who had roles in the show. All right, we're going to wrap it up soon. But uh, one question we ask every guest that comes on the show is, what's your biggest you know, issue going forward in this campaign? Like, What do you want to see a no politician or the policy or um, anything really that that would win your vote over? Sure. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, getting money out of politics. Okay. I think our process is completely poisoned, um, and you or I really have no skin in the game anymore because we're not billionaires. Yeah. So um, I'm really I'm big in f campaign finance reform, big time. Uh, Citizens United needs to be overturned. That mm -hmm. effectively legalized bribery in our political process by the Supreme Court. Horrible, horrible thing. Our founders are rolling in their grave. So until something's done about that, you know, the the little man, Joe America, your average voter, doesn't have a lot of say or power in the process. All right. Well, thank you, Eric, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, man. You can find uh, Eric at Jackman Radio on Twitter. And uh, what's your website? Jackmanradio.podbean.com. And we're on Facebook under Jackman Radio. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in to Pierce Politics. We'll see you next episode.